Chapter 8 The Reaper of Souls There was the sound of wind rushing in his ears, and for a sickening moment Malice felt himself suspended over an endless void. He heard himself cry out in terror, but it was too late to turn back. He had stepped from the precipice and realized that he had begun to fall. Destination, he heard a voice murmur in his head. You must walk a path, or be lost to the void forever. Choose. Malus closed his eyes and mustered his will. He could feel nothing. Was the idol of Kolkuf still clutched in his hand? He tried to forget the terror of his plunge and focus on the street outside the ancient building. This is my path, he thought. This is where I choose to go. Do as I command. An invisible fist closed about his guts, squeezing them with merciless might. Terrible, agonizing cold radiated out of his bones, and he was grateful for the sensation. And then came a crushing impact, and he knew no more. Malus awoke to the tickling of raindrops on his cheek. He opened his eyes and found himself face down on the black cobblestones, his head resting in a pool of brackish water and bile. With a groan, he rolled onto his back snarling savagely as a wave of painful convulsion racked his body. For the first time in days, the damnable rain felt like a blessing, their tiny impacts outlining the plains and edges on his face. His limbs were weak, his insides hollow and cold. This is what it feels like to lie among the dead, he thought suddenly. I have become a walking corpse. The sensation of scales lighting against the inside of his ribs disturbed the highborn's thoughts. You just had your first taste in sorcery, Malice Darkblade. Was it to your liking? It was terrible, the highborn said wearily. But I should have expected no less. Damn sorcery, he said with a grunt, trying to force himself upright. His limbs trembled and his guts churned at a strain, but after a moment he managed to lever himself onto his elbows. It was then that he noticed that the idol was still clutched in his right hand. He couldn't feel it. He couldn't feel much of anything. He found that he was lying in the narrow lane some ten yards from the windowless temple where he made his stand. Two or three torn bodies lay outside the doorway and smears of blood made streaks on the lintel and the grey wall. Long, deep cracks ran along the walls of the building, and many of the bas reliefs had broken into pieces, littering the street with debris. A thick pole of dust hung in the air over the structure, slowly sinking to the earth under the weight of the falling rain. From what he could see, not one of the shades had escaped alive. I would do it again, though, he said with cold certainty. I will do whatever I have to to be rid of you. Of course you will, the demon chuckled knowingly. You will do a great many terrible things before you and I are done, Malice Darkblade. It is your fate. Bah, fate, Malice Pat. I make my fate, demon. Slowly, one finger at a time, he released the idol from his grasp and let it clatter to the cobblestones. For good or ill, the path I choose in this world is mine and mine alone. Believe what you will, Tarkan said. In the end, the result is the same. Spare me your gains, the highborn growled. He looked around for spite and saw that an auglier was a few yards behind him. The cold one was lying on the side. That was a bad sign. Summoning his strength, Malus climbed shakily to his feet. There are forces swirling around you, Malus. Even now they exert their pressures on you, shaping the trajectory of your fleeting existence. Blinding yourself to them will not make them go away. Angered, Malus drew a knife out of his belt and placed its needle-sharp point at his throat. I could kill myself right now, he said. There's no one to prevent it. If I can do that, what does it say about the illusion of fate? An excellent question, the demon said. The infernal being sounded genuinely amused. Let's test your theory. Kill yourself. 
What? You heard me, Highborn. Drive the dagger into your throat. I... Malice hesitated. I got no wish to die, demon. That's not the point. Yes, it is, Sarkon said. It is precisely the point. Nothing in the world could make you kill yourself, because it is not your fate to do so. No, now you're twisting my argument, Malice shot back. I don't want to kill myself because I want to make my family suffer for the indignities they have done to me. I wish to claim the title of Volcar and more besides. I got ambitions, demon. Worldly ambitions. He paused to catch his breath and managed a fleeting laugh. Dying now would be inconvenient. And so you live, as your fate requires. The demon agreed. I knew you were gonna say something like that, Malice snarled. He sank to his knees beside Spite, resting a hand on the beast's flank. The Noglier was breathing shallowly. The highborn crawled over next to the beast's head and gently pried open one great eyelid. The eye was rolled back, showing only white. Suddenly, the great reptile spasmed, thrashing with all four legs and long, cable-like tail. Malus hurled himself backwards, narrowly escaping a swipe from the Noglier's foreleg as the cold one leapt to its feet. The one-ton warbeast spun in place, snapping and snarling at air, and then subsided. It sniffed the air warily, eyeing Malus and letting out a querulous grunt. Malus shook his head. You stupid lizard, he said affectionately. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you fainted. The Noglir let out a long rumble, settling tentatively on its haunches. Malus couldn't say he blamed the creature. Malus rode throughout the long night, winding his way up the valley in the driving rain. He had pulled the bolts out of Spite's hide and cleaned them as best as possible. The highborn knew from long experience that a cold one's constitution would heal the punctures within a few days, so long as the bolts had not been poisoned. With darkness drawing on, he'd walk the cold one back to the main avenue and started his quest for Elleril's crypt, switching to the saddle only after he became too weary to take one more step. The Nauglier plodded on tirelessly, scarcely affected by the armored Druki on his back. Vor had told him that the prince's tomb was at the head of the valley, another full day's hike up the black road. With luck he would reach it by dawn, and then find some place to rest. Hours passed in silence, save for the steady drumming of the rain and the soft slap of the Noglier feet. The numbness had finally ebbed to a kind of pervasive cold which chilled his flesh from head to toe. He craved a warm fire, and better yet, a warm goblet of wine, but there was none to be had. More than once, his thoughts drifted to the flask of wine in his pack, but each time he pushed that temptation aside. Who knew what dangers lurked in the houses of the dead? And so he rode on, cold and sore, and the demon's words preying upon his mind. What he needed was a seer. The witch king and his lieutenants could call upon their services to show them the possible outcomes of their efforts, the better to govern and confound the plans of their foes. When I return to the hag, Eldir and I will have a lot to discuss, he vowed. Of course, given his suspicions, could she really trust anything she said? He was so lost in brooding that at first he didn't notice the change in Spite's gait. The Noglier sank lower to the ground, and its gait became slower and more fluid. The cold one's nostrils dilated, drinking deeply of the wet air, and its blunt snout lowered until its chin nearly touched the ground. It was only after the war beast began a low, throaty rumbling that Malus snapped out of the reverie he realized at once what was happening. The cold one had got scent of his favorite food, horse flesh. The highborn hurriedly reined Spite in, leading him off the road and into the shadowy depths of a side lane. It was close to dawn, he noticed with a start. The gray sky was turning pearlescent with false dawn. Tendrils of fog curled around the foundations of the empty buildings and the looming towers. Malus studied his surroundings more closely. 
The buildings were made of finer materials and ornamented with graceful sinuous carvings that seemed both familiar and alien at the same time. The towers stood in greater profusion, though many had been worn down by untold ages, and some were little more than toppled ruins. He had reached the abode of the old kings, the crypts of the last princes of Nagarif. Stand, spite, Malus ordered, and dropped stiffly to the cobblestones. Every sound seemed unnaturally loud in the fog-shrouded stillness, setting the highborn nerves on end. Out of habit he reached for the crossbow, only to remember that he had given it away during the battle with the shades. Looking quickly about, Malus took stock of his surroundings, and noticed a tall pile of rubble further down the lane. The mass of bricks made a steep slope up the side of a partially fallen tower, the rough summit rising two or three stories above the building in this part of the necropolis. Stay, he told Spite, wishing he had a way of hobbling or otherwise quarreling the hungry beast. If he was gone too long, it was possible that an ogler's appetite would override its self-control, and it would go hunting for the source of the tantalizing equine smells. Glancing warily over the shoulder, the highborn moved quickly and silently to the broken tower, then began to scale the heavy, rain-slicked blocks of stone. The climb took a lot longer than expected. The rubble was somewhat unstable, and every time a hand or boot touched off a clatter of small stones, he froze in place, listening for sounds of alarm. After almost an hour, he reached the summit, and pressed himself flat against the stones, peering out across the vista of close-set buildings and narrow lanes. He saw the watchfires at once, twin pyres set twenty yards apart that sent flames ten feet into the damp air. They had been lit in a small square several hundred yards distant, casting a flickering glow across rows of dark campaign tents and against the car facade of a mortuary tower at the square's end. The faint sounds of restless horses carried over the soft pattering of the rain. Malus studied the tower more closely, a sick feeling of dread starting to churn in his gut. The stonework decorating the arch of the recessed entryway was a giant bas-relief of a druki prince clad in ornate armor. A clutch of severed heads hung by their hair from the prince's right fist, while his left hand reached upward, closing about the curve of a crescent moon. Blessed mother of night, he softly cursed. They're trying to break into Eloril's tomb. His questing hands found the idol of Kolkuv first. The brass statue was colder than ice, despite being wrapped in layers of grimy rags. Malus set it hurriedly on the cobblestones and continued rummaging through the saddlebag. Of all the places in Nagarov to come seeking adventure, they had to come here, he muttered darkly. A quick glance at the sky showed that he had less than half an hour until dawn. The druki in the camp could wake at any moment. He was gonna have to move quickly if he was gonna have any chance at all. Do you imagine this is a mere coincidence, Dark Blade? The demon sounded genuinely surprised. Malus found a small object wrapped in cloth and drew it out, then realized at once it was his brother's skinned face neatly salted and folded for safekeeping. He returned it to the bag and dug deeper. It is the campaigning season, he said absently. Druki lords take to the field in search of glory, or treasure, or both. I don't doubt many of them take up grave robbing if they think they can get away with it. But at the head of so large a force? The woods are full of shades, demon. If I got my choice, I'd have brought a small army too. His hand closed around a smooth, rounded shape. It sloshed gently as he pulled it free. Malus stared at the flask a moment, started to put it away, and then pulled the stopper free with his teeth and took a deep drink before dropping it back in the bag. How many lords could raise such a force just to go hunting relics? In all of Nagarov, dozens, I'm sure. Malus snapped. You expect me to believe that this has anything to do with me? You foolish druki, the demon sneered. Of all the crypts in this valley, 
This warband just happens to be camped outside the tower you need. But that would mean that someone else knows what I'm looking for. The dagger of Torxus, and knows where the dagger can be found, Malus said. And no one. The thought brought Malus up short. Uriel would know, he realized. Could he have raised a small army so quickly? Harganef was only a few days right further down the slaver's road. Malus took a deep breath, set his jaw stubbornly, and resumed his search. Perhaps you are right, he said. But what does it matter? Whoever this lord might be, he doesn't have the dagger yet, or he wouldn't still be here. I can still beat him to it. To the highborn surprise, the demon let out a long, rolling laughter. You are your own worst enemy, Darkblade, the demon said. So clever, so vicious, so deliriously hateful, but so single-minded. You think the world begins and ends with you. And what is that supposed to mean? Malus asked. Consequences, Malus, consequences. You have already disturbed the schemes of a great many people in your quest for power. Did you think they would forget you once you were done with them? Even now they lay their snares for you, but you are too impetuous to avoid them. And this, coming from a mighty demon who allowed himself to be trapped in a crystal for thousands of years, I can do without your attempts at wisdom. The highborn replied. Just then his hand closed on a flat, hard object wrapped in silk. That's the one, he muttered, and pulled it forth. Malus reached into the folds of silk and uncovered an octagonal medallion worked from thick brass and etched with an eye-twisting array of strange runes. The octagon of prawn was the first of the relics Malus had recovered at a demon's behest. Where the idol of Kolkuth could warp space and time around it, the octagon protected the bearer from sorcery. Frowning in distaste, he slipped the medallion chain around his neck, then picked up a small pack hanging from the cantle of his saddle and slung it over his shoulder. Then reluctantly he picked up the idol and returned it quickly to the saddlebag. On impulse, Malus reached out and patted Spite's flank. If I'm not back in a day's time, you have my permission to go over there and eat every living thing you can, the highborn growled. In the meantime, stay. With that done, Malus glanced at the dark sky, trying to gauge the hour. It would take some time to work out the positions of the sentries around the Druki camp, and even more time to slip past them and then reach the tomb. The last thing he wanted was to make it into the tower and then find himself trapped inside as the sun rose and the grave robbers returned to their labors. You could always use the idol again, Tsarkhan whispered coyly. One step would take you from here to the front doors of the tomb. Imagine that. Malus grimaced. Oh, I can imagine it too well, demon, he said. That's why I'll take my chances with the guards. The tomb's entryway was a short passage less than ten feet long that opened into a square chamber maybe twenty feet across. Statues of manticores kept a silent vigil to either side of the crypt's vaulted doors opposite the entryway, and the walls of the chamber were decorated with mosaics showing a tall, handsome druki inflicting tortures on a wide variety of noble-looking men and women. Malus saw at once that the would-be grave robbers had already gone to work on the crypt's large doors. Hammers and chisels lay scattered about the threshold, and there were deep divots carved out of the door's surface. The highborn glanced the other way, out into the square, and saw that there was no one moving among the dark campaign tents. It had taken less time than he'd thought to find his way past the guards. Between the constant rain and the late hour, the sentries had taken shelter inside the ruined buildings surrounding the square, leaving him an easy path into camp. The highborn turned back and crept carefully into the entry chamber, scrutinizing the tall doors and the damage the druki warriors had done to them. It's like they're digging into the stone, he muttered, stepping closer. 
Then he noticed the dark splotches staining the floor in front of the threshold. So, he thought, Elleril's script was not without traps of its own. Malus stepped closer still, careful not to pass between the two manticores. He crouched on his heels, studying the floor for hidden switches or plates. I wish Arlef Van was here, he muttered. He could probably do this blindfolded. I got no idea what I'm looking for. He searched the floor for several long minutes, knowing that he had few of them to spare, but found nothing out of the ordinary. Maybe they set something off when they tried to get through the doors, he thought, studying the iron rings, hinges and fittings. The highborn stared carefully at the divots carved into the doors. The wood was so dark and ancient, it looked like stone. Malus frowned. He scanned the floor, looking for fragments scattered by the workers' chisels. After a moment he saw a piece matching the hue of the doors and picked it up. The edges were razor sharp and the fragment had no discernible grain. The door was not wood hardened into stone. It was stone. That's not the way in, he realized. It's a decoy to distract looters. So, where is the real door? The highborn retreated to the center of the chamber and began to study each wall in turn. He pored over each scene depicted on the walls, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. And then he considered the scenes as part of a whole and began noticing differences in the appearance of Eluril himself. There was a definite progression to the scenes, showing a chronology of his exploits as the Witch King's Inquisitor. The last scene in the sequence showed him vivisecting a shrieking warlock with a strange-looking black dagger. Intrigued, Malus approached the mosaic. It was, curiously enough, at the center of the right-hand wall. He reached out and ran his fingers over the smooth stones of the mosaic, testing their solidity. When his fingertips probed at a long, black stone of the dagger's blade, he felt it depress and heard a gritty click. Suddenly, a greenish blast of light enveloped Malus, sizzling as it coursed over his body like liquid fire. He felt the hot wind of its passage, but the energy itself rolled over him like water and vanished in a rattling boom. The highborn staggered backwards, his eyes dazzled and his ears ringing from the blast. It took him a moment before he realized the medallion around his neck was glowing like brass hot from the forge, and realized that the octagon of prawn had saved him from the sorcerer's trap. As the ringing in his ears faded, Malus heard surprising shouts coming from the square. Malus hesitated, then reached out and pressed against the wall with both hands. A section of the wall swung silently inwards, revealing a narrow stairway winding up and out of sight. The eyes of the dead were upon Malus as he climbed the stair to the prince's tomb. Grey stone gave way to polished black marble within the stairwell and globes of witch-light flickered into life as though awakened by the highborn's echoing footsteps. Every three feet, Malus passed a narrow alcove set into the inner wall of the stairway, its archway chased in gold and carved with delicate runes. A mummified servant stood in each alcove, hands folded and head bowed to their chest in eternal supplication. Their eyes were open, maybe they had been left that way intentionally or maybe their eyelids had receded over the centuries as their bodies slowly succumbed to the force of time. And they seemed to stare at Malus as he hastened upwards in search of their master. He couldn't say how long he climbed, nor how many silent staring figures he passed before the staircase ended at an open doorway. Beyond lay a circular chamber of polished marble, bathed in sorcerous light. A thin rug of dark silk ran from the doorway to the center of the chamber, where a lectern held a massive book bound in dark leather. Beyond this lectern rose an octagonal dais, and upon the dais, standing in an upright casket and clad in black animal armor, stood the withered corpse of Prince Eluril. Eight more caskets lay in a ring around the prince's dais, and from where he stood Malus could see that each one held the body of a druki knight laid out in full panoply of war and bearing a long, gleaming sword upon his breast. The highborn hesitated in the doorway. The very air reeked of magic. 
He couldn't say why, but he could feel it, like a tingle across the skin. Faint sounds echoed up the stairwell. To Malice's ears, they sounded like voices. Was it Uriel and his men, bursting through the hidden door and racing up the stairs? Malice turned his eyes back to the prince's body. Elleril's hands were clasped around something on his chest. It could be the dagger, he thought. Moving cautiously, the highborn crept into the chamber. The air felt heavy with age. An arched ceiling curved thirty feet above, and motes of dust danced in the green glow of the witch lights high overhead. He trod carefully along the silk carpet, watching it crumble to dust beneath his feet. In ancient times, the highborn of Nagaroth would come to pay respects to their ancestors in the houses of the dead. They would walk on rugs such as the one Malice now walked on, and kneel before books such as the one before the prince's casket, and read of the legendary feats of their forebears. They would be reminded of the glories that were lost when Nagarife sank beneath the waves, and they would swear mighty oaths of vengeance in their ancestors' names. Once upon a time, the warlords of the Witch King would make the long trek to the necropolis on the eve of war, and invoke the spirits of the old kings, as the princes were sometimes called. But those times were long gone, Malice thought. Ancient ways passed into obscurity. Tomes of great deeds went unread in sepulchral darkness, and silk rugs crumbled into dust beneath the feet of a thief. Such was the way of things. The highborn edged past the great tome and gingerly climbed onto the dais. There was little room on the platform, it being just wide enough to accommodate the prince's casket and Malice found himself grasping the marble rim to steady himself. Mere inches from the body of the dead prince, Malice could see the long black dagger clutched in his hands. Strange that he was laid to rest with the knife in his hands like that, reaching up to pry the hands apart. One would think he would have preferred a sword. Malice's fingers touched the cold silver steel of the gauntlet, and Prince Elleril screamed. Terror raced along the highborn spine as the prince's shriveled eyes snapped open, revealing angry points of bluish light blazing in their black depths. The highborn recoiled and found himself fighting for balance on the edge of the dais, but before he could right himself, the prince's body jerked to a natural life, and a gauntleted hand smashed into Malice's face. The white strength was terrible, flinging Malice backward as though he were a child. He crashed into the lectern, knocking the great tome across the polished floor, and landed with a crash between two of the knight's caskets. To Malice's horror, he saw that they too were rising from their silk beds, their eyes ablaze and their jaws gaping with wordless cries of rage. Malice got his feet underneath him and drew both his swords as the undead knights leapt from their resting places with mighty speed and attacked from both sides. Their long blades flashed like wands, faster than any living creature could wield them, and the force of their blows almost drove Malice to his knees. Instead of giving ground, however, he counterattacked, feinting at the knight to his left and then spinning on his heel with a backhanded slash to the knight at his right. The highborn sword caught the undead knight just above the hip. Parchment skin and brittle bone snapped, tearing the tomb guardian in half. Fierce and strong, but fragile, Malice fought, with a savage grin as he turned his attention to the remaining knight. He did so just in time to parry a crushing blow aim at his chest. The highborn was pushed backwards by the force of the blow and felt a cold hand close about his ankle. From where he lay on the floor, the fallen knight smashed his sword into Malice's back, the blade biting into the highborn's armor and stunning him. Another blow from the second knight crashed into Malice's left arm, sending a jolt of burning pain running from wrist to shoulder and knocking the blade out of his left hand. With a feral snarl, Malice stomped on the wrist clutching his ankle, shattering beneath his heel, and then brought back his foot and kicked the fallen knight head from his shoulders. As the splintered body collapsed, the highborn threw himself against the second knight, unbalancing it and driving it back against the casket. Dust burst from the seams of its armor as Malice grabbed the knight's sword arm at the elbow and ripped it out of its socket, then drove the hilt of his blade into the leering skull and sent it bouncing across the floor. 
two down, six to go, Malice thought, pushing himself off the crumbling body when a bony hand as hard as steel closed around the back of his neck. The highborn had just enough time to cry out in rage before the wailing cry of Eloril filled his ears and the dagger of Torxus plunged into his side. 